Dr. Muirwood, setting the pace of the theme of the AGM, anticipating the future, you made the point that risk exists only in the imagination. Explain a little, please. Well, the the future the future is out there, and uh, as we as we contemplate the future and and try and come up with a perspective on it, which includes the potential for there to be extreme events, uh, um, events with large consequences, then uh, clearly. The, the agenda we, we include as part of that is, is a function of the depth of our imagination to, to uh, reflect. And um, I mean, in particular, you can see incidents have happened in the past simply because people didn't have the, the imagination to contemplate. For example, the BP oil spill was, was, was beyond the imagination of the people who were working on the rig at the time in, in a way that it shouldn't have been. You brought to attention incidents over the last 12 years. Two, you said, were hype, three were paradigm changes, and seven fell into the stitch-in-time category. Let's deal with hype first. Who was hyping? Was it the media? Well, I mean, the the two major um, risk phenomena of the past 12 years I singled out. Well, one was the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and uh, and which I think was government hype. And uh, the second one was the Y2K, which was the, the alert about um, the chaos that, w- that was going to be caused by by the um, by computers at at the point of the new millennium, which simply didn't happen. But an enormous amount of money was spent on on uh, on changing computer systems as a result. So I think that was who who calls that. Well, I mean, it was the government certainly conspired in that. It was the 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 computer industry also was very actively behind it. What about the stitch in time category? Well, stitch in time is is what I call a whole class of incidents where actually we we sort of knew enough to be on top of the situation, but we probably we either did or didn't take the actions required to reduce the consequences. So an example of that is Hurricane Katrina, where ev- everything was known in advance about the potential for storm surges in uh, in New Orleans. That simply there there being government neglect of of. Uh, building out sufficient flood defences. Where then do, do the events of March of this year in Japan, where massive loss of life, catastrophic damage, property ruined and, and energy supplies go? And at one stage you said that that they were aware of this, but it was a mixture of myopia and inertia. Well, in in Japan, the um, I, I told the story of the fact that the nuclear power plants in Japan had, had been originally commissioned in the 60s, and they'd been commissioned at a time before we had the the modern concepts of the probabilistic assessment of of hazards, and it was before also the theory of plate tectonics that understood about subduction zones where the largest earthquakes occur. So, and and uh, the first nuclear power station was founded at the end of the 60s. They then built a, a total of 14 along that section of the coast. And um, while evidence had accumulated since 2000 that in fact there had been an enormous earthquake and tsunami there in 869 AD, and the evidence had reached the point only three or four years ago. Ago that the, the scientists were claiming it had been a magnitude 9 earthquake, that, that evidence was put in front of the owners of the Fukushima plant and they, they, they dismissed it and the regulator didn't push the issue. So it was a classic case of, of um, the, the evidence was there, but actually there was resistance to, to believing that uh, action would have to, ta- to be taken in response to it because that action was complicated and difficult and expensive. Is the Japanese government solely guilty of of, uh, ignoring that and obliging themselves in, if you like, myopia and inertia? Well, it wasn't. It wasn't simply the Japanese government. It was. It was a large corporation. It was the regulator, and um, it was. It was a bit of. There was a bit of culture there too about a, a culture of assuming that that uh, the scientists, the, the who'd done the original work, looking at the hazard at the site, knew best. That new information didn't didn't threaten that. So I think there's a lot of a lot of soul searching you need to do about that. And I think the Japanese government is clearly um, part of part of that. I think the the culture is also part of it too. You used a very interesting phrase: "Fear could become the risk." What did you mean? Well, I, th- I think we've we've seen incidents where um, people are informing themselves better and better about about um, so, say the outbreak of a disease, for example, and they and while the government may tell them something, that that's not necessarily what they're going to do. And um, I, I mean, you can easily um, imagine a situation where people, for example, will not send their children to school because they think the the risk of an infection is is too high and the risk of severe complications of the infection is above some threshold. If they won't send their children to school, they may not wish to travel on public transport. I mean, it could easily reach the point where it's the fear of the disease becomes the risk, if you like. It becomes, it actually drives drives activities, it drives economic consequences more than the disease itself.
Your final point was that as human beings, we are quite uh, exercising quite a lot of ingenuity when we deal with, with uh, risk and, and catastrophe. Yeah, it's, it's a, a theme which I think we quite, quite easily neglect when talking about really large risks for which we assume it's, it's the, the government is going to have to have a, to play a principal role. And I gave the example of uh, the situation in the Bahamas where the government simply isn't involved in issues around risk or insurance and, and people have found that they can no longer get insurance on their properties because that their properties have been flooded too many times by hurricane storm surges and so uh, you can no longer get a mortgage on properties in certain areas of Grand Bahama. But as a result, people have started building houses on stilts to actually reduce the risk and bring them back into being insurable again. And that's it's, it's an interesting example of spontaneous adaptation without the intervention of, of a government agency, which is, you know, when we talk about these issues, we generally assume there is going to be some government function in helping sort it out. Dr. Muirwood, thank you very much. Thank you.